Hello everybody and welcome to another Sintratech talk. Today we're shooting for the stars and talking about rocket science. I'm very happy to be joined by Michael Kerschbaum of Aris. Hello Michael. Hello Yannick. Michael, can you give us a short introduction about yourself and Aris who, for people who don't know what that is? Yes, so as already introduced, my name is Michael Kerschbaum. I'm the system engineer of um, Aris this year. Uh, rocket project Euler and uh, what Aris does is basically we're building rockets but not only rockets we're also building rocket motors and anything that's associated with aerospace and we do this in the frame of a <clears throat> student organization we every year we collect about 80 students from all around the German-speaking part of Switzerland and engage them in building rockets and rocket motors very interesting so Uh, ARIS stands for Akademische Raumfahrtsinitiative Schweiz, uh, which means Academic Space Initiative of Switzerland, you can say. Uh, what is the, the general vision behind it? What would you say? So I think we at ARIS are pushing for more aerospace topics in Swiss universities. I think mm -hmm. uh, with the great engineering minds of, of Swiss students, um, this topic is still underrepresented in Swiss universities. And in this way, we understand ourselves as a as a force pushing forward aerospace topics in the in the field of yeah of academia in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So you said students you are collecting basically from a variety of universities. What's what's your background? And you're working in a team called uh, Project Euler. What's the background of your team there? Yeah, so I myself, I'm a physics student, but mm, we're not limited to only science students. Um, our team is very, very diverse. So we have students from different fields of studies, such as physics, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemistry, and even uh, management, for example. And in this way, um, we kind of get the best of every field of study and everyone can bring in the knowledge they already acquired during the studies and build up on that and, and yeah, get some hands-on experience, real, hmm. like designing real rockets. Hmm. So... Tell us more about Project Euler, your uh, technical leader of uh, what was your team working on and how did it go so far? So every year uh, in Aris, uh, there's a rocket project, which is there for building a rocket to compete at the Spaceport America Cup. This is a competition where student teams from all around the world come together in the desert of New Mexico to launch rockets and compete against each other. And Project Euler is the rocket project of um, ARIS for yeah, the years 2019, 2020. And our goal was to build this, the first supersonic rocket of ARIS and indeed the first supersonic rocket of any student team in Switzerland. Interesting. So how did the year turn out? I guess COVID-19 did sabotage that as well to some extent, like most project in this year. Or how did it affect you? Yes, so unfortunately also Corona didn't stop uh, for our project. Um, we had to cancel our maiden launch, which was planned in spring. And eventually also the Spaceport America Cup 2020 was canceled due to COVID. And this was a big impact for the, for the team, or this had a big impact on the team, because uh, this was kind of the main goal everyone was working towards for one year. And now this goal being gone, we needed to reevaluate our mission goals and what we wanted to achieve for our project. Mm -hmm. So what are the next steps? Uh, do you continue with that project or what, where is that leading now? So for us, um, we had a launch back in summer in Switzerland. Actually, the first launch that was organized by um, the student teams, uh, we together with the team from EPFL um, organized uh, this maiden launch in Switzerland. And after that, we are still planning for launching our rocket supersonic. In Switzerland, of course, there's too little space to launch rockets to <laughs> the full height. So we are still looking into um, possibilities of launching our rocket supersonic. Mm -hmm. Can you Maybe for me, who has absolutely no idea about rocket science, can you tell me about like the differences between, you said it's the first rocket to actually go for supersonic. Uh, so what's different in regard to previous pr student projects? And yeah, 
what are the challenges basically for that? So, yes, so the first supersonic rocket also means that the rocket will be subject to greater forces than previously known. I mean, mm. you know that when you're going by car and the faster you go and you hold out your hand, the stronger the force on the on the rocket. And there are some aspects of the rocket that need to be engineered in a particular way. For example, the rocket's fins, um, they need to be designed in such a way to really withstand the forces during supersonic flight. Yeah. Okay. So how optimistic do you see the project going? Do you do you think you will be able to achieve that goal that you set yourself and for Euler? So for us, um, we now finished uh, our second rocket um, based on the learnings we got from the maiden launch. We mm -hmm. built the second rocket and we are now looking into possibilities of launching this rocket. And um, this is actually a quite a hard task because in, in Europe, um, such projects are not very well established um, as they are in America, for example. No. Um, so we really have to look and see whether we find a, a um, yeah, appropriate place to launch our rocket. No. Interesting. So let's switch the topic a bit to 3D printing because uh, Sintratech was actually involved a bit in that project. We sponsored certain parts for your team's rocket and uh, so in general did you use additive technologies in constructing your rocket was that part of the uh, yeah of your construction process yes so indeed we use additive parts throughout our rocket um, from different parts such as the launch lugs which hold the rocket in place while during liftoff um, to structures for mounting uh, board computers. For us, it's a very convenient way of, of fast prototyping and also um, a cheap way to, to mount lightweight structures inside the rocket. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe give us a summary of, of what types of, of, of 3D printing technologies you were using and maybe why? Uh, yes, so mainly we use um, FDM, um, which we yeah, printed ourselves uh, for, mm -hmm. as I already mentioned, for purposes of mounting board computers inside the rocket, but also, for example, for um, yeah, guiding the motor inside the rocket. So very different uh, points of, of use there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we uh, used SLS, which we got sponsored from Sintratech as our um, main part to guide the rocket off the launch rail. And this is a very, very crucial part because it really determines the, the flight um, of the rocket. If the launch lock doesn't hold in the first few moments of the flight, um, the rocket cannot go off the launch rail safely. What were the requirements, the material requirements then for, for such crucial parts? So for us, there is one main requirement, which is also a requirement from from the competition itself, which is that the whatever structure we use, the, this structure for the launch lock has to hold the rocket in place and it has to support the full weight of the rocket. And in this way, um, we had to do a bit of prototyping ourselves with hmm. our in-house 3D printers, but in the end came to the conclusion that we needed something more robust than that. Yeah. So was that the reason why you Put, took SLS, uh, la selective laser sintering, into play there so instead of, I don't know, other printing technologies. Exactly. So there is basically, yeah, or let's say the standard approach for, for these parts of the rocket is to get aluminum parts and turn them. The problem mm -hmm. with that is, however, that um, this strongly limits the yeah, uh, opportunity of optimizing the aerodynamic shape of these parts. I mean, these parts are mounted outside the rocket, mm. meaning that they yeah, have a big effect on the drag of the rocket, which then again limits the um, performance and how high the rocket can go. So in this sense, it's good to have the possibility to aerodynamically optimize the shape of this part, but at the same time, you want to have the robustness that the rocket is, re rocket is really kept in place during liftoff. Mm -hmm. So you had a launch, as you said, in summer. Uh, so did these launch locks that we laser sintered for you, were they a success, you would say? Did they hold what you expected? So for us, they worked perfectly fine. I mean, they 
the launch logs weren't tested uh, during lift of the first time. This would have been not safe for us. We did yeah. some <laughs> prior testing, of course, for that. But even during um, heavy testing, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't um, destroy these launch logs, which meant that we deemed them safe for flight. All right. That's good to hear, of course, that uh, that all worked. So what would you say in your field, what's the biggest advantage that you gain from constructing these parts? Not only the, those laser-centered parts, but I mean, in general, the, the additive manufactured parts in your prototyping process, what would you say is the main advantages you gain from constructing it and building it in that way? So at least for our project, I mean, we're a student project and we do not have the possibilities of having access to, I don't know, drilling or turning machines. Hmm. And um, in this sense, the have using additive materials um, offers a big variety of, of using it inside the rocket. And it also allows us to, for example, very quickly integrate new features to our rocket. For example, we decided um, shortly before the launch, meaning a month before the launch, to include further board computers to measure additional um, aspects of the rocket during yeah. the flight. And this can only be done if you have access to um, technologies such as SLS or other 3D printing methods. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the disadvantages? I mean, while the SLS parts are certainly very robust and for our use case of guiding the rocket off the launch rail, um, it, they work perfectly fine. Uh, I think right now we are still not there or we do not have the materials yet to use them in very heavily um, mechanically used parts, like for example, the parts that holds the motor in place. Uh, so in this sense, uh, we would not use the, the SLS parts or other 3D printed parts in such mechanically uh, strongly, uh, how should I say, uh, parts that are strong, heavily mechanically used. But would you say in general in your field of aerospace, uh, do you see these technologies having a place in developing rockets? Yes. So for us, it's, as I already mentioned, they offer big flexibility when prototyping, of course, but even beyond that, um, when trying to integrate new features to a product that you already, for example, fully designed, um, having these, the access to additive materials um, really allows one to, to be very creative with integrating new solutions and, and coming up with new ideas, ideas that would not be possible otherwise. No. So you already mentioned the, the example with the, the, the board computers. Do you have another example maybe of, of, of like a success that only came into play with uh, 3D printing technologies? For example, something, I don't know, that you perhaps constructed on a, in a different way before and then switched it to additive manufacturing and it turned out to be the better choice? Um, maybe not in that direction, but in a similar mm -hmm. direction. So we had to... Shortly before before our launch, changed the motor that we used because of um, issues with importing the the right motor um, to Europe, and this meant that so all of a sudden the parts that we built for holding the motor in place, not not mechanically, but just to to guide the rocket, they were not proper anymore, and we had to quickly come up with a with a yeah solution for that. And yeah, the way we did it was to uh, 3D print these parts. And it worked no. perfectly fine. Interesting. I think this COVID crisis, uh, to us at least, showed a bit how the importance of local production. So we had other student projects that we sponsored parts to, and it kind of revealed that it is important to rely on local partners instead of like, I don't know, international deliveries that may be cheaper, but in such uncertain times may not... Uh, be very reliable so was that an important factor to your uh, when constructing this rocket did that play a, a role in your project yes so you should probably not get me started on issues we had with with <laughs> uh, manufacturers from from outside switzerland <laughs> um there have been huge delays also due to corona we waited for yeah. some parts from from the us for for three months even oh. um so having the opportunity to order parts in switzerland basically a few minutes of of car ride away and in the worst case just go there and pick them up is was a, now in hindsight um 
yeah, very valuable. And we probably, or at least I will recommend the next teams to use as much, uh, make use of uh, as much Swiss companies for manufacturing rocket parts as possible. Good to hear. So apart from Euler, always has a variety of different projects, right? So um, can you maybe talk a bit more about other projects that you know make use of additive technologies as well and how they are used there? Do you have maybe some examples? Uh, yes. So for, uh, as I already mentioned this year, um, beside the rocket project Euler, there's also the project Iride, which is working on their own um, motor, a hybrid rocket engine. Mm -hmm. And one part of, of such a engine, mo a rocket engine is the nozzle. So the lower part where the rocket exhaust is, is coming out. Yeah. And in fact, the There was, the, or it was considered to make use of additive techno um, technologies even at such a crucial point because it's, it allows a cheap way to um, manufacture such complicated shapes. Uh, of course, there again, there's the problem with what material you use mm. because they are subject to very high temperatures. But uh, even then, um, the team did not give up on this idea and is further investigating the, the opportunity for the possibility of using um, additive materials for, for their motor. Yeah, I think it's a big uh, research topic as well. We have a, um, a customer use case about uh, the research in the southern part of Switzerland, SUPSI. They are, for example, using our machinery to 3D print like uh, gyroid structures that they want to use for like ceramics that can be used for exactly that topic. Can you maybe talk a bit about for you, like if you could like dream of an ideal scenario where 3D printing is, is part of uh, in that aerospace field, what material requirements would be like a game changer in your eyes? Yeah, so I think for us, as already mentioned, um, in aerospace in particular, drag is a very big factor. Mm -hmm. So being able to arbitrarily change the shape of, of parts that are subject to either um, the, the drag from, from the airflow around the rocket or also the, the, from the exhaust of a rocket through the nozzle, uh, being able to yeah, produce any shape uh, one or the simulation guys can think of uh, is very, very important. However, to really make use of, of this technology in aerospace in the yeah, uh, places that I just mentioned, um, one probably needs to work on materials of or find materials that can, on the one hand, um, sustain the forces acting on them mm -hmm. um, during uh, rocket liftoff and during supersonic flight, but also, as you already mentioned, uh, high temperatures, for example, when, when using it for um, structures close to the motor exhaust. Yeah. Do you see personally uh, in, in that field, do you see technologies like our selective laser sintering being part of that industry as it may be for prototyping or as end use parts like you used it? Definitely. So for us, as I already mentioned, it's for us, it was not only the prototyping aspect because mm. we used your parts really as parts that were flown in the rocket. Um, but I can also think of, of Uh, use cases where one easily and very cheaply can try very different shapes and and test them for for mechanical properties so for example one could still try to optimize the the part that uh, you were so kind to make for us and and do this in a way that one could not do when using other techniques of manufacturing mm -hmm. so maybe a bit of final words about aris where do you see that project going in the future will we see like um, a big swiss aerospace program at some point or what is like where do you think that is gonna go in the near future let's say yeah so for us it's one of the the main goals is still to continue building rockets and to be what be one of the first student teams to to reach orbit even um, but not only on the technical side, we are um, trying to push the boundaries in Switzerland, but also, as I already mentioned, on the academic front, we really want to push for topics of aerospace in the uh, curricula of, of uh, universities in the German-speaking part. And we see, we see our role to prom um, yeah, promote universities to have their students engage in projects such as ARIS, to have them ready um, for 
yeah, future no. use um, as an engineer in some uh, aerospace company. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the the key, right? It would be like right at the source. I mean, we from Syntrotech are trying that as well. By we have a lot of uh, research institutes that already make use of our technology in the education. Um, so maybe your personal conclusion and uh, summary of the cooperation with Syntrotech. How was it for you? And how happy were you with that cooperation with us? And yeah, maybe. Where do you see us working potentially together again in the future? Yes, at this point, I definitely also want to thank you at Sintratech for um, yeah, supporting our project. We really count on the, as I already mentioned, the, the Swiss excellence in engineering. And for us, working together with you was always very unproblematic. You were very responsive, had the parts manufactured immediately. Uh, we didn't really feel like being sponsored or being treated as different, we really felt um, as if you were pushing for us as you would be pushing for any other partner. And we will definitely hope to be able to continue working together with you. Uh, so we really want to make use of your know-how and the knowledge you have in producing such parts, because as we already saw, um, there's many ways of making use of them when building rockets or rocket motors. So maybe someday we will see some centered parts in orbit from the Swiss space program. I would look forward to that. We will, of course, have a use case about your application in the near future to read more about this. But I think for now that was a great preview of what's to come. And yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for your time and talking to us about this interesting field. I think it was very insightful. And yeah, I'll leave the last words to you. Yeah, thank you, Yannick. Um, as I already mentioned, there's uh, a lot of people working hard um, to have this rocket come together. First and foremost, of course, also uh, our academic partners of ETH, HSLU and ZA AW, um, and also our main sponsors, uh, Ruerg and Maxon. Um, together with these Swiss companies, um, we were able to build the first supersonic rocket of Switzerland and also the first hybrid rocket engine. Thank you.